Hello and welcome to Kingdom News. This is the time in our show where we have our Kingdom Spotlight and this week's guest Tony Moore is going to share some wonderful tips, tools and information with you. There's so much information that she could give, that she could share. I know this interview could go on forever. I'm not even really sure where to start with her, but I first want to welcome Tony Moore to Kingdom News. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. So you look her name, it says Tony Moore Asset Protection Strategist. But she's so much more than that. Ha, ha, Tony Moore is so much more than just the asset protection strategist. She's a lawyer. She's a businesswoman. She's a woman of God. She is passionate, extremely passionate about helping others pursue their purpose and walking in their gifts and their talents. And so I'm excited to have her on. So Tony, let's start with just me asking for you to share just a little bit about yourself. Um, hi everyone. I am a, I have been an attorney for over 20 years. I am a dreamer by nature. I um, pretty much am very passionate about helping women become better versions of themselves. Uh, I realized, as I was telling a friend of mine, I was one of those triple teens that most people were like, oh, she's just going to be a statistic or a pretty girl or something like that. Uh, thankfully, there was a family who uh, saw my potential and they helped me before I could help myself. And uh, one of them even told my mom about Milton Hershey School, which changed everything for me. Um, and then I left, got a chance to leave Harrisburg and I ended up going to the University of Penn and I was pretty much on a journey because I've always, it's like a journey to more. Uh, but I was thinking because of my mindset that it was, the more was maybe men or, or, you know, fame or fortune or something that didn't have to do with me. But when I realized that, you know, God does all things well. And I went through my own unfortunate events of trying to find happily ever after outside of myself that um, I realized that it's a lot of work that we have to do. So I started out in insurance defense, hated it. Then I found myself in family law where I loved it for a certain point. And that's when I started doing the empowerment ministry as a lawyer, helping people when they were in their rock bottom places to just understand that there's always an alternative to their story. So I spent a lot of time doing that, um, even helping them with their finances, helping them with their businesses and things of that nature. Until I realized that, you know, once again, there's another way and I can't always help people at their level. Um, so I had to learn something more. So the more for me was just realizing that that socioeconomic class, that identity that we must have with regards to money, because money answers all things and everything. So I started to learn more about money and wealth and empowerment, and it shifted my whole life trajectory for the past 16 years. Okay, so let's take a step back. You said that you're from Harrisburg. That's Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing before you tell us about all the wonderful things that you're doing now. <laughs> tell us a little bit. Let's go back, you know, a few years, just a few years. And tell us about your upbringing in Harrisburg and how you even ended up at the school that you ended up. So let's go back. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. So that's like 40 years ago <laughs> when I was a child. Um, so I, my mom is a God woman. Uh, she, we grew up in a Pentecostal church. She believed in going to church seven days a week. Uh, and a lot of her life was spent going to church or running away from her abusive husband, you know, and that really kind of like put a damper on my spirit, but it also shifted some things of my mindset. So I spent a lot of time devising ways of running away from her situation. That was most of my childhood or we were living uh, every year we moved in the middle of the night um, or we had more month than money. Um, and it got to the point where I started looking at drug dealers as possibility of my daddy Warbucks. If you ever read or heard about this story called Annie, 
I was thinking, okay, maybe I can't have a fairy godmother who'll take me far, far away from my experiences, like um, Winona and um, Good Times. So I started to think maybe a man could do it because they were doing a lot of stuff anyway. And my mom reached out to my godmom and my godmom told her about the Milton Hershey School. And that's what she did for me. Because I'm sure if it wasn't for someone telling my mom about the Milton Hershey School, I don't really know where I would be today. So what were things like once you got to that school? Because I'm sure that was a, a completely different atmosphere and environment for you coming from the situation that you were in in Harrisburg and then ending up there. Oh, yes. Um, um, so it was uh, one. I was not um, living in a women's shelter with my mom. One year we lived in a women's shelter for over a year. I was not living in the basements with my mom, with my other siblings, where pretty much people's dirty clothes was our, you know, our bed covers and where we slept. Uh, I had my own bedroom, which was an oddity for me. It was taking, took some getting used to. Um, I had rules, which I didn't really have rules because I was an adultified teen at that point um, where, you know, we get in and fit in. And I was always watching over my sisters or trying to boss up my mom, as I say. So I got it, but I was always smart. We all have something from the Lord. And he just gave me a gift of being super smart. So uh, I got a chance to read books and I got a chance to study. And then I tapped into something I did not know that I had, which a gifting of writing. So I got uh, involved into my school's, um, uh, what is it, magazine. They had a magazine. And I be, ultimately, before I graduated, I became the editor-in-chief of that magazine. So that's what really helped me um, shift things for me. Then I had some teachers who had already gone to college because uh, college was not an option for me and were my situation. And we also had something called career day and career day. I don't recall ever having that in Harrisburg at all, but in career day, uh, I don't know what I came up with, what I was going to do. I just did the assignment, but someone had talked about being a lawyer and how it just seemed like there was no lines. There was nothing that they couldn't do. And it, it just resonated with me. So I was like, you know, the next year, my junior year, I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. And I think at that time, Oprah Winfrey had came out as well. So I decided I was going to be Oprah Winfrey and a lawyer. <laughs> okay. So, and, and that's what I wanted you to kind of talk about is like, how did you decide to become a lawyer? So at that point, you're in your sophomore, your junior year in high school, when mm -hmm. you make the decision that you're going to become a lawyer. So you graduate from high school and you go to the University of Penn. <laughs> right. And at any point, did you change your mind about becoming a lawyer or you, once you made that decision, it was really clear that that's what you were going to do? It was really clear. I mean, a couple of times, I, uh, twice, I got on academic probation meaning that I did not have my scores up to the level that it should be at an Ivy League school or any school for that matter. Um, so they were, I would was threatened to get kicked out of school, but it was my dream of being a lawyer and ideally helping children not have to live my situation. That really was the saving grace for me, you know? Even with, with things happening around my way, uh, by then I had had to cut my family off because there was just still a lot of trauma and a lot of situations that make me want to run back to be someone else's rescuer. And someone had told me that I would probably be better off helping my siblings if I actually got a degree. So um, just the thought of being a lawyer and being able to help my siblings uh, better than just finding some place to live in someone's basement or projects. So that's really what kind of like helped me to um, stop being tossed to and fro when I was going through a lot of obstacles in my own mindset um, and made me focus on Tony, you want to be a lawyer. So, and you're going to help other people and you're going to help yourself. So that was pretty much the thing that kept me going. Good. So you said you ended up on academic probation, but you said that you, what the one thing you know that is that you, you, you're pretty smart. So Talk about that a little bit, how we, even though we might have all the tools and all the gifts, we still may not move in what it is that we're supposed to move in. What were some of the, the stumbling blocks, the, the setbacks, the 
Tell us a little bit about your mindset and the things that were preventing you from actually achieving at that level that you should have been achieving from the beginning. Well, um, the University of Penn is an Ivy League school. A lot of the students there have already been prepared to accelerate at that level. When you're from the projects, you're not prepared to accelerate or even to be successful. Um, it's more about getting and fit in or survive. So um, a lot of them had learned some study habits that I did not have because I was already super smart. So I can read a thing and I could pretty much, you know, pretty much put something on paper to go through. Um, at the University of Penn, we had something called a syllabus and they were like, okay, after whatever the term is, you got to come up with the books, the papers, you know, the scenarios or anything. And I did not take that seriously, right? I, I was smart enough to get into the school, but I did not have the, what is it? The, what is it? Uh, the mind, I want, I didn't have the mindset to stay at the school um, until I almost got kicked out. Um, first time, and then I leveled up. Then it happened again because I was still trying to find my own way, and I was by myself. I didn't want people to know that I was a traumatized teenager who didn't have a life. I pretended like I was someone else. I was not going to church. You know, men and and um, alcohol became kind of like my the thing that satisfied me and numbed me and made me feel like I got in to fit in, whichever way. However, that was. I, I just did not want to feel like the oddity, like the the project kid in the Ivy League institution. Um, but when I took this class, and the class, we covered Erickson's um, seven stages of development, eight stages of development. And I realized that I was sabotaging myself because other people did not teach me. They didn't train me up. They did not help me become a better version of myself. And when I realized that, I was like, hmm, well, Maybe I can train myself up. So, uh, and that was my sophomore year where I literally used myself. I did my assessment about where I was, what I didn't have, all the eight stages that I didn't go through, I went through them. And I realized that even if nobody trains you up, that you can train yourself up, you know? So that's how, you know, that's my whole thing at this point in my life right now, because I know I did it before. And then I kept doing it over and over again. That regardless of our stations in life or where we find ourselves, there's still something inside of us that, you know, if there's a trigger, then there's something that we have to fix or a lesson we need to learn. And I kept sabotaging myself because no one expected me to be successful. No one prepared me to be successful. They were, And even I'm sure I was someone's um, affirmative action baby, you know, a project kid from the projects going to the University of Penn. I'm sure statistically no one really expected me to succeed. So I pretty much had to be my own cheerleader. Absolutely. And that's what I wanted you to share is sometimes you really do have to be your own cheerleader. And in order for you to really manifest everything that is in you, in order for you to be able to walk in those gifts and those talents and everything that God has for you, you have to do the difficult work. And you were willing to do the difficult work. Like you said, you examined your life, you examined your issues, your setbacks, and you realized, you know what? It doesn't matter what my mom did or didn't do or anyone else. At this point, it's up to me to do better. And so I wanted you to share that because for someone who might be watching this and like, you know, like, well, oh, you know, she had certain privileges. I think she's made it very clear. There were no privileges that she had. She was given an opportunity and she used that opportunity to be able to move forward and grow. But it still required some difficult work on her part. It required a lot of work on her part. Not just that she would work hard academically, but that she would do the healing work required mm -hmm. to become that person that God wanted her to be. She had to dig deep in order to be able to move forward. And so for those who find yourself find yourselves in these repetitive situations and you wonder why you can't move forward, you have to come to the point where one day you decide, I'm going to dig deeper. I'm going to do the hard work. I'm going to really take a hard look at myself and figure out what things need to be fixed, healed, corrected so that I can move forward and do all the things it is that I've been dreaming 
about doing. So that's really good. Thanks for sharing that. So we move forward and we have Tony Moore, the lawyer. So you've graduated, you've finished up your law degree and you start practicing law. And you said you initially went into family law, but you didn't really, you didn't really like that too much. Mm -hmm. um, no, I did not. Uh, because one, the older Tony can speak about the younger version. I um, did not realize a lot of what I was doing was when I saw women in distress, it was almost like it was putting me back in that situation of trying to save my mom and my sisters. But it was also causing, it was ricocheting in my life because it was very dark and heavy trying to walk into hell with someone and try to empower them and encourage them to, 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 to not, to, to pretty much not be a victim in life. Right. So I didn't like it, but that's where I was. And that's, and I, and I liked it initially, but then it would be sir every once in a while, it would be some hard places and spaces. Cause I was doing family law. I was doing bankruptcy law. I was doing foreclosure law. I was doing estate and probate. And a lot of the people who were, I was inheriting from the law firm were people from broken places and spaces. So some of them got it. Some of them were just like, I just got to go through it. I hate my life. So no matter how much I would try to help people like this one really hurt because it was a mom and a dad and they hated each other. So the first fight, the mom won. The second fight, the father won. And then he started to pit the kids against the mother. And that was really hard for me. It was another situation where it would be a protection from abuse order. And, and, and I saw that she was an abused woman. We would get our protection from abuse. But then the abuser would sweet talk the woman and she would come back and all that stuff. And I was just like, I can't have all these passion and my passion is contingent upon someone else's mindset, but I was still stuck in my story of brokenness. And you know what I mean? And it was still part of me that felt like I was attached to them. And then I would, I'm also an empath. So I would pick up all their negativity and then it would spew out of control in my own life and situation. But I, you know, I pretty much wrote this book called stop being a doormat. Because at that time, that's who I was to my sisters, to my mom, to the partners at the law firm, you know, to even to some of my clients. Um, but I had to um, get out of that situation and I didn't know how to, you know, until one of my sisters shot herself or her lover had shot her. We're not sure. But I do remember at that time and I'm a lawyer, you know, had all the accoutrements of success. And I was still in the doormat state because, you know, when I got sick, um, I found out I had another, I had a given birth to a child, had an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and my tubes had ruptured, almost got sick. My, one of my girlfriends took me to my, to the hospital and I rolled over after the surgery and called my secretary and told her to cover for me. That's where I was. She said, girl, don't nobody care about you. If, if you died because you so bent on trying to get back to the law firm to show that you're worthy, maybe some of the partners would have showed up at your funeral, but they surely would have replaced you. So when I was in that um, season of having to heal, that's when I prayed to God. One of my sisters who had shot herself, she was trying to recover. She didn't make it. But during that summer, I was also asking God to give me a second chance um, so I can become the woman in my dreams. And I was like, even if I got to start over, P.S. y'all, you listening? Don't don't just say if I got to start over because God gave me a second chance. But I literally went from the corner office to a telephone um, uh, solicitor situation. But that was an opportunity for me to get a chance to know me. That's really good. You know, a lot of times, again, you know, God has really been talking to me lately about healing and becoming whole and making it more and more apparent that 
until we become healed and we operate in the wholeness that he wants us to operate in, we're just dysfunctional. We -hmm. cannot do the things that he wants us to do. So again, it does require that level of work, that that level of desire to want to, to do different. And you keep kind of repeating that over and over again, you know, Everything could be handed to you, mm-hmm. but if you don't put in the work and you don't have that intrinsic value, we talked about that earlier, something within you that's prompting you and pulling you and pushing you to want to do different and to want to have more, there's nothing really that anyone else can do, no matter what is laid before you. You know, faith without works is dead, right? Right. You can have the faith, but again, if you're not willing to put in the work, it makes it extremely difficult to be able to move forward. So you are working out your own stuff. <laughs> and I just, let me take a step back. I want to, because I want to say this. She said something. She said, don't, when you say, you know, I might have to take that step back or, you know, start all over. That's the one thing I think that people get nervous or worried about. They're so worried about what people will think. How will it look? But sometimes you literally do have to take that step back to be able to move forward. I think sometimes pride and ego keep us in too many things that we know we're not supposed to be in. And we're unwilling to move because we're worried about what it looks like to someone else. Oh, well, look at her now or look at him now. But we've got to get rid of the ego and the pride and really, again, take a hard look at ourselves and say, you know what? Yeah, take those five steps back so that you can really build a solid foundation. So when you move forward this time, you don't have to go back again. And I'm sure as we continue in the story, that's what you're going to find out is that that step back actually allow her to be able to build the foundation in a different way for her to be able then to be propelled into what it is that she is doing now. So don't be afraid to take that step back because sometimes that's necessary for you to really be able to take that step forward and become who it is that God wants you to be. So thanks for that tip. So now, you know, you've taken that step back. You're looking around and you're like, okay, God, you know, I said it was going to be okay, but I'm not really happy with this. And I'm sure something in you kicks in like, okay, this is temporary because I know there's so much more. So what happens? So I'm, it was good for me actually, because of the fact that when I did uh, leave the the firm, I was litigating. I was dealing with other people's problems and things of that nature. I was still in the litigation arena, but then I had taken on a support role, right? And the support role allowed me to literally have business hours from eight to four. I never have no business hours from eight to four. Mm-hmm. It probably took me six months to just get readjusted that my weekend was my weekend, right? Um, so that really uh, helped me out. And then I started to ask, like, what what do I want? What do I like to do as a person, you know? Because um, I was always in the doing mode or the rescuing mode or the positioning mode or, you know what I mean? Or just literally like living by default, whatever that looked like, that's what it was. So that's when I started to, you know, figure out what I liked. And that's when I started to go on bike rides. And I did the, uh, I think it's the MS 180, uh, 160, you know, that's a ride from Philadelphia to uh, Atlantic City, you know, and that was for uh, multiple scoliosis. Um, And then I started to... uh, to help my sisters. And I started to read more books and, you know, and at that time also um, something happened to another one of my sisters where she was actually, um, well, our, our version is that she and her husband were fighting and she's the one who ended up dead. Okay. So, um, but you know, that was a situation and a bad situation. And I was, I mourned her for about, 
a whole year of my life, you know, because uh, we went to church. I mean, we was broke, but my mom, she was rich in faith, you know? And, um, and I was just like, how do people speak over our lives? And we end up like, you know, dead. Now I had two sisters dead and I didn't understand anything. And then it was something inside of me. That's what triggered. You listen to my husband. He'd be like, Tony was telling everybody to go to school, get a good job. You know what I mean? Make more money. That was my formula for success. But then after one of my favorites passed away I and, and I mourned, I came forth and I was just like, yo, this ain't going to be our story. You know what I mean? Like this was my mama's story, but this ain't going to be my sister's story. And when you look in the history, that's a lot of women's story about being domestic violence survivors. And I'm like, we wasn't going to earn just to be somebody's punching bag, you know, especially if we went to church. Why are we black and blue in the pew and nobody's talking about it? And, and I took this um, class because uh, I'm a lawyer and they have something called continuing legal education. And one of them was protection from abuse. So I, I needed the credit. So I took it. Um, and the one speaker pretty much said that women who are domestic, um, when they're in violence and they're victims of domestic violence, you almost got to lead them out for about 10 months out of their situation so that they can remember who they are out of their trauma, out of their environment, out of the whispers, out of everything so that they can heal themselves. Cause as long as they still in that environment then they're going to forget who they are. And I was, and it was just something inside of me that was like, you know what, some kind of way we got to, we, you know, we can't be survivors anymore. I'd rather have you say you rewrote your story. That was a bad chapter. Now this is a new chapter. And it was literally it was that when after mourning my sister and then hearing, I couldn't even stay in the classroom. I bust out crying because I had my mom now that I was mourning, my sisters that I was mourning. And I was just like, all this time, we just patty caking on some principalities when we really have to help people make over themselves. And so I started this um, nonprofit called um, a diva moment. People didn't like it and they shut it down because they thought it was demonic um, because of the word diva, which means woman in, in Italian. But um, but I still was like, okay, when I come back and I pick back up diva moment or whatever her name will be, I'm not going to ask people who don't support me for support. Even if I'm going to use my skills, I'm going to come back and I'm going to figure out some kind of way to help women appreciate that whatever story that they inherited don't have to be their inheritance. Absolutely. You talked about, you know, the woman who finds herself in a situation of domestic violence and all that is required to be able to have her come out of that situation. You know, people don't understand that you don't just end up in a situation of domestic violence like overnight. Mm -hmm. In most cases, the the abuser, the one, and let me let me take a step back. For you, you know, it's your sisters that were in those situations. You know, it it was it's women. But I want to make I want to put this disclaimer out there: men can end up in situations of domestic violence also. Okay, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen as often as women, and it is definitely not talked about because. On top of the shame of being in that situation, then it's the shame of being a man who has to admit he's been abused by a woman. So it is definitely not talked about. So the situation with people who are in domestic violence situations, it doesn't happen overnight. It is a breaking down of you mentally, spiritually, and emotionally before the physical violence even begins to start which is why when the physical violence begins, you're so depleted at that point that you just stay and you accept it, which is why it is important to begin to build the woman up and begin to change her mindset so that she understands that she's valuable, that she's worthy, that someone can love her, you know, that she is enough. It doesn't just happen overnight. I need people to understand. You don't just wake up one day and this man who was this perfect gentleman all of a sudden is now physically abusing you. No, I want you to be aware of the signs. You know, if a man is, de you know, degrading you, if he's talking down to you, 
if he's trying to isolate you from your family and friends, if he's saying things to you that are negative and not encouraging you and not supporting you, those are the red flags. Those are the warning signs that something may not be right here. And so it does not happen overnight. You need to be aware of how you end up from being a totally healthy, you know, confident, okay woman in many cases, you know, we all struggle and have our issues, but then ending up in that situation, it is a process. They take you through a process. So you need to be aware of that process so you don't find yourself in that situation. Someone who loves you will not talk about you. Someone who loves you will not try to isolate you. Someone who loves you will encourage you. They're going to uplift you. They're not going to tear you down. That's where it begins. And when you see that, you need to run quickly. Quickly. That's it. Plain and simple. So you have this passion for women. You have this passion for helping people um, in business. You have this passion for helping people in finance. You're this writer. Tell us a little bit about the books. You have several books out. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing with regards to uh, it's not always physical. My sisters were victims of financial abuse as well. So they didn't have any money. So that's how they also stayed. So when I'm writing my books, it's always about empowerment, but it's also reminding women that God is in us too. And he's given us the power to live our best life. And that's how I end up realizing um, that for my mom, she was in a domestic violence situation because she had no money and our life got worse when she left her abuser. And the, and as, uh, as a domestic relations, former domestic relations attorney, I realized that when women are financially abused, they don't really have any options. You can't really leave your abuser. You're usually in a ghetto um, neighborhood. You usually can't feed your kids. And so that's where I've shifted a lot with regards to um, helping women embrace their economic empowerment to attain wealth. So the books, like whether it's Boss Up or it's like an ebook, it's always like God has given you the power to be a woman of your dreams. Uh, Stop Being a Doormat was essentially saying that even with the hurt and the harm and the abuse, because that book was about myself and one of my sisters who ended up in the hospital, how we came out, one of my sister passed away, but I was just like, I'm going to be the woman of my dreams. You know, um, uh, my book uh, with regards to uh, handle your business, I gift that to my clients when I help them start business because it really is a step process with regards to knowing that you can package a solution that you have, you know, and also how you can be a solution and how you can protect your money and your assets and, and protect your legacy. And even my newest book, Up Level Your Life, that literally is taking you from my basement life to my boardroom life and how I shifted myself be ain't transformed by the renewing, right? And realizing that at every step, you got to bet on yourself. You got to trust God. You got to chase after your, your purpose and your power, embrace your power. And then you also have to realize that the power of God is, is inside of you. But it's like, to me, it's like a muscle. You know what I mean? It could be atrophy, you know, where it can be soft or you can make it stronger by using it, by, you know, testing it, by proving that there is more within you. And that's one of the reasons why I even have the school of boss, because I'm like, wait, a minute. we love the Lord. We we follow Jesus footsteps and we are being comforted by the Holy Ghost. Tell me again why we're black and blue in society. Tell me again why we are like not living our best life. Tell me again why we're looking for a rescuer when we should be working out our own salvation. Right. So for me, it's when we talk kingdom, it's not just the word that I heard. When I look at the Bible, I look at that as a blueprint that God is like, look, this is the steps to get you to live your best life and that more abundantly and realize that it ain't just about you, you know? So I now look at myself, no real, no daddy. <laughs> My mom had a lot of issues. We had no money, but guess what? God still breathed in me for a reason. So even when we have nothing, we still got God. 
Absolutely. And that's what that's the other uh, other thing people need to understand. You know, even when it, when you look around and you feel that there, 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 there's nothing, you know, there's no finances, you know, there's no other relationships. You have to realize that God is still there, that he promises that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. And it is absolutely true. We just have to believe it. So we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we're going to talk with Tony about the asset protection strategist and what she does in terms of her skills as a lawyer and being able to protect families, because that's something else as kingdom people that we have to do a better job at is really being able to be good stewards over whatever finances that God has blessed us with, whether it's little or big, we still have a responsibility to be good stewards. So we'll be back. I have a question for you. Are you tired of being stuck? Are you tired of year after year making goals and plans to accomplish something and it just doesn't seem to happen? Are you tired of not being supported in your dreams and your goals and your vision? Well, I have an opportunity for you. I want you to consider becoming a member of Success Arise Academy. This is a membership that is designed with you in mind. It provides education, inspiration, and transformation for you to be able to achieve those goals and become everything it is that God has created you to be. This is a membership program designed for women to be able to also come together and encourage and support one another. So if this sounds like something that you're looking to be a part of, I want you to visit www.successarise.com because it is time for you to move from stuck to unstoppable. Thank you. We are back with Tony Moore, legal strategist, uh, boss up queen, uh, kingdom woman. Like I said, there's so many titles that I can give to this amazing woman of God. You know, I'm someone who is really, really passionate about pushing people into being the best that they can be. And I think that's why Tony and I connected on the level that we connected on, because we are two women of God that when we get together, we're like, listen, we want to do this and we want to do that. And if only they would do this and if only they could do that. And we're just like ready to go. So when I tell you what she's saying about helping people, she's for real about it. She is definitely real about it. So there's this whole ministry side to her. And I think a lot of what we talked about deals more with the ministry side of you. Uh, we have to understand that ministry looks different than just being behind a pulpit. You know, God tells us that we are supposed to go out, right? And how we go out, it, it looks different for everyone else. You know, there's that marketplace ministry where even in the midst of doing business, you know, you are discipling, you're understand, you're helping people to understand who this God is and why they need to up level and why they can overcome and why they should have faith. And so Tony is doing just that in every area of business that she works in, there is that whole God piece that shows up. You can't separate the two, even though she tries and I try, you just can't separate it. When it's in you, it's in you. So tell us about what you do legally. You know, Tony is like me, you know, she loves bossing up the women. However, she is a lawyer who can assist anyone, male or female, when it comes to handling their business. So tell us a little bit more about what you do in terms of, you know, um, family planning with, um, you know, whether it's a will or, um, I can't think of the name, it's um, family planning. You go and take over. <laughs> yes. Um, so one of the things that I also 
realize is that a lot of us have been and cultivated to be consumers, right? But we're not understanding that we're also supposed to be creators and we're also supposed to have be owners and we're also supposed to have, be stewards of what is given to us, right? So in my business as a lawyer, a wealth building lawyer and asset protection strategist, I'm always reminding my clients that God has given you the power to create wealth. And for me, I've learned that, you know, it's having a wealth plan. I tell people all the time, whether you have a business or not, you should have a side hustle because the side hustle will give you that extra money. See, the J-O-B will keep you just over broke and you will always have most of the time have barely enough, right? Because that's how it's supposed to be so that you can spend 40 years of your life working 40 hours. And then at retirement, you survive off of 40 percent of your income that you probably complained about throughout your life. Uh, when you start appreciating the financial plan, the financial security, then that's when you say, but what God has given me, I'm still supposed to save some for later. I'm still supposed to turn some liabilities into assets, right? I'm still supposed to have a financial plan, ideally a college plan for your children, ideally a retirement plan, right? And how do we do all of that? We start looking at our finances and we start working out our finances to make them work for us. And a lot of people, because once upon a time, I worked at Primerica Financial Services in the midst of lawyering, right? And I love that area because a lot of people weren't talking to us about finances and how we can turn our, you know, how we can do better with our debts. And I look at debts as it devours every believer's treasures, okay? So when we start using our money, not to always gift it to the debtors, but to be the owners of what we own, then we start looking at investment properties and investment vehicles because it, I always tell my clients, you can never leave, but you ain't never left. I don't care how many people preach and tell us that, you know, we can reap the harvest. Oftentimes, unless God gives us a miracle, the harvest is based on what you seeded into the ground, what you protected, what you cultivated, what you leveraged, right? So I'm always thinking about our kingdom legacy. What does that look like? And it ain't supposed to be broke. You know what I mean? God gave us the ability to attain wealth and we're supposed to live in that more abundantly and also be a wise person. That saves up for ourselves, our children, and our children's children. But it's, it's less about the talk and it's more about the walk. So that's why I'm always encouraging our my clients to either have a great retirement plan and live like beneath their privileges or have a side hustle that can then be used as a seed into their legacy, financial wealth legacy plan. And that's what I assist with, with regards to the financial wealth legacy, and also with regards to appreciating that the estate that we leave is what we live. Most people think that an estate is when you die. No, an estate is what you have. It's like assets minus liabilities. It's like, you know, income minus debt. It's like what is in your home, the equity in your home, the equity in your assets, the equity in your business. But if you are always saying that you're scratching and surviving, if you're always the one who is uh, cleaning up the table and not serving from the table, then you will always never always be always trying to figure it out as opposed to allowing God to work through you to work it out. That's what I do. That's what I love. So now this is, this is just a question for you, for someone who might be watching, right? Who mm -hmm. let's, let's paint the scenario of a situation similar to maybe what, you know, what you came out of, you know, growing up in Harrisburg and you have a family, you know, with a mom who's struggling that has several kids, you know, she's working at a job where she's barely making it, you know, she, even at $15 an hour. Now we know that, you know, especially now in the midst of COVID, everything is extremely expensive, you know, uh, food that, you know, I like, you know, I, I, I'm a cook, I like cooking. So I always like to reference food because I know how much the pricing of food has gone up. So prior to COVID, if you went and got a family pack of chicken wings, yes, it was like, you know, seven or eight dollars. That same pack now is sixteen dollars. So we know that inflation has definitely taken place, that everything is on the rise, whether it's groceries, whether it's um, it's uh, your, your insurance, everything is more expensive. 
So as this mother, this single mom or single dad, or even a family of, you know, a husband and wife who they're barely making it, you know, they're barely making ends meet. Because unfortunately, that's the situation for many of the families um, for today. You know, mm -hmm. they, they're going to say, well, that sounds good, uh, Miss Moore, or, uh, you know, that that you know that's just not for me though that's not my situation what do you say to that person you know what little tip can you give them to encourage them that even though it looks hopeless there is hope yeah well one thing even though my mom was brokey broke broke she always figured out a way to come up with seed money for her pastor i'm just saying and she always figured out a way to have what she wanted when she wanted to go away. So when people tell me that they don't have money, very rarely do I ever meet someone who don't have an option. I'm just saying. My mama had options. She chose a different way. Even some of my siblings, when they would come to me in the in the midst of it all, they still had some options before they got broke and broke, broke. You know what I mean? So, and even with there's... Um, Someone always says, like David Bach, I don't, you know, he says how we can um, uh, save up money even with latte, you know? So there's some choices. I have friends, they're like, I'm broke, I can't do anything. But every year they went on vacation. Every year they have the best clothes and they have a lot of stuff. For at least 10 years, I, while I was building up my business, we went nowhere. I said, we got staycations, Okay. And even like we didn't go out to the restaurant, that was like a treat. So after a certain point, you have to start asking yourself, that's where the financial plan comes into place. You got to ask yourself, what do you have to give up? Because we can't have this and that. It's eventually you got to sacrifice something so that you can save some for later. You know, because it would be great to have a silver spoon in our mouth and somebody giving us $10,000 and when we can reap the benefits. But that's oftentimes not us. Sometimes we got to start from the small things. There was this one woman, she was a cleaning lady. Cleaning ladies don't really get a lot of money. But guess what? She said, I still want to save up some money to create an endowment plan so people who look like me and talk like me don't have to suffer when they go after their dreams. So we can't have it all. You know, silver and gold, I have none. But when you look upon the fact that you can still change the trajectory of your, your, your situation. And I do know that the poor we will have among us. You know what I mean? I know that. And so I don't always profess that what I've learned helps every single person. But I will tell you that when you start choosing, am I going to continually make debt my lifestyle? Because at one point it was my lifestyle. I wanted to look rich, even though I was living poor. And I would take out the equity anytime I could. Then I would start because that's what I learned to do. And so I start saying, you know what? I don't have to have everything right now. I don't have to look rich, okay? I don't have to please and appease everybody, you know? I can, I have a car, you know, because I'm like, wait, I'm still building up my business. I'm still paying off my school debt. I still want to lay up some money for my kids. So my car is not brand new. I could care less. But I was talking to somebody who lives in an apartment building and she talked about how she about to spend another thousand dollars a month for a car so she can look rich. So the question is, what do we do with what we got? When we use what we got and make a plan, then of course, it's the little things. It's just little things that help us out. Even my one girlfriend was telling me her side hustle, she went from a part-time business to a part-time job at Target. She's telling me about all the benefits, including the retirement plan and a college plan. Like you were like, wait a minute, let me go and apply to Target. Absolutely. You are absolutely right. The question becomes, what sacrifices are you willing to make? You know, discipline. You have to become disciplined. I read a quote uh, and I shared it with my coaching group. Discipline is deciding that what you want later is more important than what you want now. Mm. That's good. You have to make the decision that what you want later is more important than what you want now. And you can use that in any area of your life, not just finances. Because in order for us to become 
the people that God has called us to be, because we've been called. Mm -hmm. We have to be disciplined in all areas of our lives. And we have to stop making excuses. I wanted to make that, I knew, I knew where you were, were going to go with that. In other words, it doesn't matter where you are. The question becomes, where do you want to go? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to achieve? So you know what? You're right. You're struggling. But there's something within that budget where there's some flexibility. Are you eating out several times a week instead of making your lunch? You know, or do you have unhealthy habits that you need to get rid of anyway, such as smoking? I'm amazed, honestly, that people still smoke, and that's not a judgment. I, it really isn't. When I heard, when I was in Wawa and heard how much it costs for a pack of cigarettes, I was like, that would be my deterrence right there. And some, people, some people, some yeah. people, I remember when I used to do this for a nonprofit, I used to actually do like financial circuit circles and I mean, for whatever reason, they opened it up for men and women, but the three core co cohorts I had were all teachers and they were all women. And the one teacher realized that she had a Starbucks budget and she didn't realize it. So that tracking, she realized that she was giving over a hundred dollars a month to Starbucks. And that's where I was going to go next. I said, okay, I don't want to go extreme. I won't go cigarettes. Yeah. I'll go Starbucks right. because I don't drink coffee, so I had no idea that, you know, a locker, chocolate, mod, whatever, all of that stuff could run you six or seven dollars and people yes. are getting them every day. I'm like, for coffee? Are you kidding me? Or so lunch. Like, or lunch, right. My husband, yeah. he said he saved a lot of money during COVID. He said, I never realized, because some of us just do it instantaneously. It's just something that we do. You know, he said, I never realized how much money I spent for lunch and coffee. But when we all yeah. got shut down for nine months, he started looking at his bank account. He was like, wow. Yeah, it does add up. The little things begin to add up. And so you have to start someplace. Yeah, that's the bottom line. You have to start someplace and you have to be committed to that change. So, Tony, can you please share with everyone how they can reach you, your your website, your uh, social media, all of that information, where they can get your books. Um, yes, uh, a great place to start is TonyMoreESQ.com. That's T-O-N-I-M-O-O-R-E-E-S-Q.com. And that leads you to my social media is actually at TonyMoreESQ. And Tony Moore ESQ is like a, a page that shows you, here's my books, here's my podcast, here's my website, and here is the protection, protect your assets guide. Um, that's one of the things that you had alluded to with regards to how I help people protect their, their legacy, their money, their estate, you know, for the next generation, including themselves. Because that will be probably another conversation about how we leave like um, a legacy that's not a liability. Yeah, uh, I like that. A legacy that's not a liability. Yes, that's good. You know what? I told you we could go on. There's still so much more we could cover. We could stay in that, what you just said, for another hour easily. But we have to wrap things up. So I thank you for coming on. I thank you for the encouragement. I thank you for being so transparent. Uh, again, if you want to connect with Tony, she has given you her website. She is not just a legal strategist. She is great with business. But more importantly, she really does have a heart for people. So she's not going to be someone who tries to take advantage of you. She's going to guide you and she's going to try to offer you what is best for you. So if you're looking for someone uh, to provide you some legal services, she is definitely the go-to person. Now, now, you're licensed in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, correct? But you can give information to pretty much anyone, anywhere, correct? Pretty much. Yes. Okay. So don't hesitate to reach out to her. So again, I thank you for joining us, Tony Moore. Any last words of encouragement before you end? 
Uh, you know, I always remind people that uh, this is your story. This is your life. This is your story. And when we're kingdom, we have to make sure that our story reflects God's glory, right? So be the walking, talking epistle evangelist, if you will, leader in your own life. Realize and appreciate that. Guess what? God didn't, pre pre he already knew about your problems. He already knew what you inherited. But the most important ministry move that I can suggest anybody make is to take whatever they inherited and make the most of it that manifests bigger, greater, and more than they've ever seen or heard before. I've seen other people do it. I've done it myself. I'm still encouraged as how people manifest the little things and make them greater things. So I always challenge my, my fellow brothers and sisters, you as the walking, talking epistle, the next level tes uh, testament of their life. What's it going to look like for you when they speak about your life, your leadership, and your legacy? That's good. Thank you again. And thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Kingdom News. This has been your Kingdom Spotlight, hosted by Gwen Goolsby Tillery. And once again, we thank our guest, Tony Moore, for being with us this week. New shows coming to Kingdom Purpose TV.